Welcome to Texas Heart Institute educational series. The topic of this uh, particular program is breaking the barrier in cardiac and vascular interventions. I'm your host. My name is Von Krasier. I'm Peripheral Vascular Intervention Program Director in the Department of Cardiology at Texas Heart Institute and also President of the International Society of Endovascular Specialists. Our special guest today is Dr. Miguel Montero Baker. He is an Associate Clinical Chief in Division of Vascular Surgery and Endovascular Therapy at Baylor St. Luke's Medical Center. It's a true honor, sir, to be here. Uh, thank you. This is the second time and hopefully uh, many more to come. But it's a pleasure to be here with you today. Thank you very much. So uh, I would like to um, uh, in start this program with uh, asking you several very important and pertinent questions related to diagnosis and treatment of uh, peripheral arterial disease of the lower extremities. Let's uh, concentrate on um, the particular important uh, questions related to that particular topic. And let's uh, mention past, present, and future of surgical and endovascular treatment of peripheral arterial disease of the lower extremities. But also I would like to hear from you uh, specifics uh, related to the unmet needs okay. and uh, also uh, the aspects of uh, how has uh, vascular surgery evolved over a period of the last few decades. So well. let's start with the question Mm -hmm. of uh, task classification, okay. how it has evolved, where we are now, and how often do you use it in your practice? Very well, thank you, Dr. Kreischer. So task refers to the Transatlantic Society consensus. It was an attempt to try to get a lot of professional groups uh, across the global scenario on the same page. And there was a series of publications, one focused mainly on the uh, risk uh, and the medical management of a lot of these patients. And then one more attempting to go deep into the more technical part. Now the task, in an attempt to uh, give some form, uh, the task group created anatomical degree of classifications. And as, actually, as you can see on this slide on the right-hand side, specifically on the aortoiliac system, they went on to classify uh, patients within four groups, A, B, C, and D. That then went on to be done also for the femoral popliteal and for the below the knee disease. Now, <clears throat> if you specifically uh, go into the aortoiliac disease, one of the things that had for many years uh, raised some eyebrows or at least created discussion around the topic was that this is the C and the D patterns of disease. And what the uh, consensus hints to is that all these patients are better served with open vascular repairs. Now that's easy said, uh, not necessarily easy done, specifically because of the risk patterns of patients. One would then argue that there are extra anatomic bypasses that are uh, made in a way to meet the needs of maybe the high risk surgical patients, because most of these open repairs would actually imply that the patient would need a laparotomy. And not a lot of these patients can actually undergo a cross clamping of the aorta safely. And not a lot of these can actually bounce back quickly, specifically the more frail patients. Now this is an image of one of my actual patients. Uh, this is a bypass from the subclavian to both common femorals. And that's an extra anatomic bypass, which some Authors actually argue that could be even done under local anesthesia for high-risk patients. Now, sadly, the patency of these extra anatomic the reconstructions is very low, uh, specifically at five years. And then one of the most dreadful complications, and this sadly happened to one of my patients, is that the grafts can actually infect and erode in patients that have poor wound healing, something that is un unfortunately frequent. And so one of the greatest advances I think we've, we've met at this particular point is that with good technique, adequate catheter sizing, and the development of new uh, covered stents that actually are good to uh, reconstruct these aortoiliac diseases, 
This is that same patient. I actually did a reconstruction of his inferior aorta with stents and was able to safely take the infected uh, open bypass out. And this patient went on to do very well. So if I may, uh, you showed us an extreme case, really. Those are really rare scenarios where you have to do extra anatomic bypass. And uh, more frequently, you can do a conventional surgical repair, aorto by iliac and aorto by femoral bypass in uh, Lerich or Correct. CTO of the, of the aorta. And uh, it was a nice example that you showed how you can rescue this patient with endovascular approach. So uh, not to belabor too much on this particular topic, but I would like to ask you, what is your current approach? Even though this is really advanced task classification type of a scenario, what is your current approach when you uh, deal with uh, Lerich uh, uh, in uh, patients with uh, comorbid conditions, not a standard patient with uh, low risk for surgery? Do you? Uh, think more about endovascular approach or do you still use quite a bit of uh, surgical techniques? I think Dr. Kreischer, any time that we have these questions about this matter, uh, we are definitely leaning in many ways on the surgeon's ability to have every uh, tool and technique at his disposal and so there is certainly an inherited bias whenever you face these cases. Are you comfortable with uh, extensive endo? Are you comfortable with crossing CTOs, and is this probably the best or not for your patient? I do agree with you. Uh, still, we push our fellows to learn exposures, to understand how to expose the aorta, to make uh, retroperitoneal dissections of the aorta a thing of every day for them. They have to be comfortable. But the higher risk patients, I quite frankly find myself more and more doing the mendo. Now, this was an extreme case, but sometimes a very bad Lurish with just two kissing stents into the distal segment of the aorta can be fixed rather uh, simply. This is actually an extract from the COBES trial, which was a randomized study to showing covered, PTFE covered stents to bare metal stents and helping us understand that we actually have pretty good patency rates that are far and beyond those of some extra anatomical bypasses that some of these patients with severe comorbidities would have had instead of an endovascular repair. So I think that we have met a lot of the technical needs and in the right training setting, a lot of these patients are served well with endovascular therapy. Excellent, thank you very much. Another very controversial and hot topic is a common femoral artery disease, extensive atherosclerotic disease, which is frequently accompanied by extensive calcification that can involve not only the common femoral artery, but proximal or osseal SFA and profunda femoris. And in my experience, for a very long period of time, this was a so-called no-touch zone for endovascular intervention until relatively recently. Can you elaborate a little bit more? What are the latest advances and uh, how do we treat this at the present time? And what does the future hold? Yeah, I. I Definitely think this is a hot topic. Um, and I, I think many times the discourse of no touch area or no endo area uh, is or was many times pushed by just uh, turf wars uh, where there was attempt to protect uh, on the surgeon side, for example, to try to remain constant and valid within. But as you have developing vascular surgeons that push and push the limits, then the no option have started to become options in many <laughs> ways. Uh, but we need data, of course. You know, this has to be, this cannot just be a discussion uh, and certainly not a turf war. Uh, I am very happy to say that now we work much more collegially and that a lot of these things are a thing of the past, uh, which we've obviously shown here at Texas Heart Institute where we work together. But let me bring a couple of important things here to, the, uh, to this slide that I wanted to share. This obviously shows a rock in the common femoral, something that still I believe most of us surgeons believe the standard of care should be an endarterectomy with a patch. But there was a, a, a study a few years ago, the TECO trial, which showed that there was actually uh, low morbidity and lower morbidity uh, in relationships obviously to the wound when you would offer open versus endo in patients. And so that led uh, my good friend Cohen Deleuze uh, 
uh, in the Netherlands to actually initiate a study called the VMICFA trial. And this is just a prospective multicenter single arm effort to assess the performance of a stent with mimetic properties in the patients with common femoral disease. Now, these patients should have symptomatic disease that was limited to the common femoral artery. And this is very important because I would still advocate that extensive disease into the profunda femoris is very easy to fix with surgery, and one should consider that above anything. But when I say morbidity is, most of us surgeons have been in a way, shape or form, uh, have a few skeletons in our closet about complications from groins. Uh, I will tell you, not every groin is the same. Uh, multiple previous interventions make it very difficult to get in there. Previous surgery makes it difficult. And certainly, obesity makes it a high risk for infection. And I'll tell you, dealing with a patch infection in the groin is no easy task. So in this particular study, there was technical success of 100%. And at 12 months, there was already, this is not necessarily published, but it's already been out in the public, as it's been in some of the major vascular conferences around the world. The 12 months primary patency rate was 95.2%. And the freedom from clinically driven TLRs was 97.8. So we're showing very good results. It seems like intimal hyperplasia, which is always our fear of endovascular th therapy, is not as severe in the common femoral. And a lot of MRI studies functionally have shown that common femoral is actually a very stable artery. When we walk or sit, what moves is the proximal SFA and the external iliac. The common femoral actually doesn't have a lot of forces. So as there is no extrinsic compression that severely moves this, it is probably the hypothesis behind it that the results are pretty good. So I believe that we're looking at a possible change, and I think that if the patient is risk stratified and it seems to be a bad patient for open, this seems to be a good alternative for us. Very good. I, I truly share your views as far as this particular zone is concerned. And, uh, uh, I'm very glad that uh, Dr. Cohen Deleuze, who's a vascular surgeon, actually moved this uh, frontier forward because uh, then I believe that the vascular surgery will accept it more readily than if it would be by radiologist or interventional cardiologist. But I think also uh, what is very important in my personal experience is uh, the advent of new technologies mm -hmm. such as uh, uh, shockwave, for extremely calcified vessels, uh, etherectomy devices, and stents that are durable. They don't break easily, and uh, they show pretty good long-term results as far as patency concern. That, in my opinion, is one of the major factors that allowed us to uh, be able to be where we are now with the common femoral right. artery disease. Right. Here I actually have a, a slide to share uh, of an example that's publicly available. Uh, but this is a situation where lithothripsy, as you can see there, as depicted by the image in the middle, uh, does a great uh, job at, at rupturing and, in a way, uh, minimizing the calcium burden as it actually can break it into smaller pieces. And you have pretty good results because we're always very worried about some very severe uh, dissection in this territory. And, of course, I think... There are other atherectomy tools out there that I think as, the, as we use them more could be very good options to treating these patients and not necessarily leaving scaffolds behind. Again, no data really at this time to uh, share on specific common femorals that's worth uh, discussing, uh, but certainly things that I think will open possibilities for the future. And of course, we should add drug eluding technology balloons. Of course. Certainly helped in this type of a scenario. And lithotripsy, we were in a trial here at our institution. Mm -hmm. We have seen some impressive results in very complex scenarios. Mm -hmm. So uh, let's move further down to uh, okay. the popliteal artery and uh, talk a little bit about um, popliteal or femoral popliteal uh, aneurysmal disease. Again, for a long period of time, this was completely in the domain of vascular surgery, and it still might be for most of the scenarios, mm -hmm. but I want you to uh, share your views as far as surgery versus stent grafts for this particular problem. Right. So one thing to, to have in mind with popliteal aneurysmal disease is, mind you, 
it's different from the aortoiliac aneurysms or, or aortic aneurysms in the sense that rupture is not necessarily the driving force. In these cases, the clinical problems that patients may have is that the aneurysm itself becomes a nidus for clot, and there's a lot of mural thrombus, and so it's not rare that these patients, if, if undetected, come with an acute limb ischemia as they've trashed entirely their their distal flow. And so recognizing this early obviously allows us to offer a good therapy. Now this slide that I present here just is a very nice diagrammatic way of showing what's currently out there uh, for the management of these cases. So one on the left uh, shows a medial approach with a bypass with two incisions. The one in the middle shows a posterior approach, so you make an incision behind the knee and then interpose a vein. And then the last one shows a stent graft which in the event that we have adequate landing zones above and below uh, has shown good results uh, overall. Now I think if there are lots of data and, 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 and many times registries, we don't have a very solid comparable uh, study that I could mention. There is a very nice meta-analysis that has shown that mostly this have historically been repaired open. Uh, that most of them have been done by medial approach, uh, but that there's certainly an uh, important number of patients now being treated with endo. I think that it's important for us to be clear that this should be a patient-centric decision. Uh, and even more so, after one decides, well, I think this patient is high risk or low risk, then we have to be very, very critical about the technical part, because it's not as easy as saying, well, I think he's high risk and I'm putting a stent in. Well, it's in many cases, you have very dilated arteries. We don't necessarily have all the gamut of sizes, and certainly we have to consider that we definitely need an ideal situation when considering a stent graft to put above and below. Surgery, of course, as always, is gonna have its inherent complications to the incision and or bleeding, but unfortunately, there's also many endo leaks that can happen both in stents or in open. Uh, specifically in the medial approach because you don't reset the aneurysm and a lot of times the sural vessels can actually continue to feed into the aneurysm and many times the size could be even compressive and giving chronic pain. Um, I know you have a lot of experience in stent grafts mm -hmm. uh, and I think in very selected patients it could be an option but I think one has to caution the audience that it may not be a great solution currently for everybody. Right, yeah, we, we published uh, several manuscripts from our experience with a variety of stent grafts. Uh, and uh, as everybody knows, there are balloon expandable and self-expandable stent grafts. Of course, balloon expandable stent grafts should not be used in this particular location mm -hmm. because of tremendous risk of crush Correct. and uh, kink. And what's also very important there is not a single stent graft at the present time approved for this particular application. Sure. There were some attempts in very early stages, but uh, they were abandoned for, to me, unknown reasons. But I think that's the frustrating part, that we do not have a strength graph that has been proven to function well over a long period of time. So uh, I do have my concerns relating the use of stent grafts for this particular application uh, because we do not have a dedicated dedicated stent graft. So that, that is obviously one thing that uh, is uh, within the unmet needs Correct. that we have to uh, still hope for that will happen in the future. I'd, I'd add to that, and this is just personal knowledge, is that in many times I'll reinforce the stent grafts with a mimetic stent inside. But it has to be a very particular set of situations where you can actually size appropriate both the stent graft and then the mimetic stent that goes inside of that to give it a second support system. Uh, but right now I'm not necessarily sure that one can ever, ever adventure to say that endo is going to be primary above this. I think that open, good surgical technique may probably be suitable for most patients. Very well. So this is kind of a segue to uh, how have new technologies evolved and uh, what uh, can we expect uh, as far as treatment of critical limb ischemia is concerned? I know you have tremendous experiences with treatment of critical limb ischemia. You have been involved in clinical trials, and you published and presented on ma at many different meetings on this uh, topic. So I would like to hear your views and your experience uh, on 
past, present, and future, and also the unmet needs in this particular disease. Correct. I, as you fancy into the more extreme scenarios of patients nowadays, where you have severe below the knee and even below the ankle disease patterns, uh, then you have to take into consideration many things. Now, one of the things is it's not going away and it's getting more and more. And the reason is because we have a society that is becoming older, uh, healthcare improves, and that is met with patients that are many times in phases of decay uh, in the extreme segment of their lives, but they're still patients, they, they, they deserve care. Diabetes is driving a lot of this also, uh, a tie to in crescendo obesity. And then a subset of those patients, which is the uber complex patients, are those that are in already renal failure on dialysis because a lot of the uh, derangements of uh, electrolytes lead to severe calcification patterns. So I think the major advancement in peripheral arterial disease intervention on the endovascular world is the understanding that it's not coronary vessels because many times uh, we have found ourselves in history thankfully uh, that we have pioneers that are cardiologists that have pushed the limits and applied tools from one territory to the other uh, but we've obviously learned that these could be longer segment lesions that there are different calcium patterns in those lesions and so I would believe that technology has emerged up to the needs I mean, we now have micro-braided, longer catheters of support. We have dropped the profile of crossing devices, support devices, down to a very useful scenario. We have developed peripheral wires that are uh, workhorses and then grammage of up to like 60 grams of pressure for CTO wires that you would maybe in coronaries never consider using. But it is a, a very different scenario. Uh, and. And then on top of that, we, we have recognized much more the wound care that has to be associated to all these patients. So, so if, the toe and flow. If, my, if I may uh, interrupt and ask you in particular, uh, I remember when I started working on peripheral disease and interventions in the early 80s, mm -hmm. uh, critical limb ischemia and below the knee disease was another what we call a no-touch zone for any interventions, it doesn't matter whether you are a cardiologist or radiologist or, or a vascular surgeon. And part of the reason for it was that we didn't have tools. Yeah. Uh, I remember Dr. Schwarten was one of the first ones trying with balloon to address those particular problems and Gerald Doros, an interventional cardiologist, uh, was brave enough to uh, intervene and showed pretty impressive uh, results. But the tools were missing, lacking. and. Uh, so uh, if you would have 30 years ago present the information of uh, endovascular treatment of uh, below the knee disease, everybody would look at you and criticize you as you are heretic and you are doing something that is totally out of uh, the range of any interventionalist. So uh, in a way, the way I see it, I have to congratulate the vascular surgeons like you to show boldness and determination to uh, be able to move to this frontier and break those barriers to get us to the point where we are now. And as you started talking about the uh, technology that is available now, we could only dream about it in 20, 30 years ago. So uh, here you have an example. Yeah, this is and a case. You, you can mention. Yeah, I wanted to show this case uh, just because it shows a couple of things. Uh, one is uh, that we still unfortunately today, knowing how important it is to do a vascular workup, we see patients that come to our clinic that have been amputated with no vascular workup. So this lady underwent an amputation and obviously she was profoundly ischemic. Uh, and <clears throat> the, obviously the incision uh, of the surgeon that did the foot surgery didn't work well. And also how we have a needle going from the anterior lateral segment of almost at the ankle level in what seems to be a very athletic and small perineal artery, almost the size of the needle or smaller. But on top of the technology we were talking about, we've gotten much better at doing these retrograde accesses, which I really believe the bidirectional approach gets you in many times success that before we would have not been able. Actually, there's a paper 
in the journal of endovascular therapy from back in 2008 while I was in Germany where we showed that up to 20% of the time we would fail to cross antegrade. And so this has opened uh, the panorama for many things. Now, this is an x-ray guided puncture, but we always advocate for ultrasound guided at high definition. In this particular case, I won't um, expand with much of the angiographic results, but we were able to rescue two vessel outflow, which then led to the development of a, a transmetatarsal amputation modified. You see that there's a lot of skin missing, but here's where again that marriage of uh, toe and flow, the podiatrist working side by side with a vascular interventionalist, be that an IR, an IC, or a VS, to understand the needs of the wound, creating a beautiful wound, seeing that patient through, and then placing a skin graft for absolute wound healing on a TMA and a patient ambulatory within a, a month and a half of a presentation that everybody else wanted to do an above the knee amputation. So, so I really think that we have a lot of those gaps now met. So Dr. Montero, you just mentioned a couple of very important things that have really broken the barriers and moved this uh, approach forward. One is mandatory use of ultrasound for treatment of below the knee disease, critical limb ischemia, alternate access. And if anybody would like to get involved in this field, this is like a, an absolutely essential tool. Now, another thing what you mentioned, and uh, I have to uh, congratulate uh, your colleagues, vascular surgeons, and few international cardiologists that uh, were trailblazing in this field, uh, gaining access to uh, distal, posterior tibial, anterior tibial, or even peroneal artery with a needle, with direct access, was very bold and brave type of approach. In the past, we would fear this greatly because of the risk of compartment syndrome. But of course, with the uh, advancement of uh, techniques uh, using ultrasound, this is relatively low risk procedures. However, things can go wrong and you can certainly develop compartment syndrome. So for those, in my opinion, that are involved in this type of approach, they should be aware of it and they should know how to identify it and how to treat it or to have a proper backup. I'm talking about non-surgical inter interventionalists. Absolutely, I, <clears throat> a multidisciplinary team is needed and I think uh, the interventionalist, non-surgical, should always be part of a team that has the ability of calling the vascular surgeon or orthopedic surgeons, hey, I think that we have a possible compartment syndrome and we need to be, you know, take care of it promptly. Uh, I would advocate, uh, I have a, a few very uh, short tips here on this to close it, but extreme access is doable and it's a good tool to save complex feet wounds. I think that patterns like orphan heel or the desert foot should be recognized and treated aggressively. Venous ar arterialization, which is probably a topic that you and I should talk about on a, on a one hour session alone, should be considered. This is really breaking a lot of the boundaries of no option patients. But advanced training is possible and courses are available uh, all over the place. And I think cadaver courses are probably the best way to go out there and train and understand what the ultrasound offers, how to put the patient on the table, what to learn. And again, like you said, recognition of early complications of this patient. Certainly don't experiment on patients. We, we just had a course like this here yeah. in Houston at the Midas Center and uh, this was the International Society of Endovascular mm -hmm. Specialists first uh, Houston symposium where you actually own cadaver. We had 12 different stations with x-ray equipment and ultrasound equipment showed to the participants uh, all the techniques available to treat uh, below the knee complex disease and patients with critical limb ischemia. And thank you very much for- Yeah, it was lovely. Uh, I would just say to anybody out there, don't miss this course. This was the first of hopefully many, and it's all hands-on. Uh, I was actually delightfully impressed with how great it was. Uh, I think we even made a little video, so hopefully the ISEVS webpage will, right. will have it up soon, but um, it's certainly something that I think we should continue to push uh, on strategies. Thank you very much. Uh, this will complete part one program on breaking the barriers in peripheral vascular interventions for treatment of uh, lower extremity arterial disease. Please join us for a part two presentations on this uh, topic. Thank you.